And I now give the floor to His Excellency Prak Sokhon, Deputy Prime Minister, Minister for Foreign Affairs and International Cooperation of Cambodia. Mr. President, distinguished delegates, let me start by congratulating Excellency Ambassador Tijani Muhammad Bande of Nigeria for your election as President of the 74th Session of the United Nations General Assembly. We have full confidence in your leadership and you can count on our support for the delivery of your mandate. Since the adoption of our founding charter, the world in general has been a better place. However, new conflicts emerge, some of which still persist today. Other has ravaged for decades. My country has the sad record of being one of the most bombed nations in the history of mankind, while it was at war with no one. Among its great merits, the United Nations is here to help to prevent these conflicts, modestly called regional conflicts, from degenerating into a full-scale global confrontation, especially during the Cold War. The end of the division of the world into two rival blocks gave rise to a new world order, as it was followed shortly by the emergence of new economic powers. These dramatic changes paved the way to a new reality, that of a multipolar world. This new world should allow peaceful coexistence between countries with different political systems, different religious and cultural references, different concepts of the economic role of the state, but where all agree to subject themselves to a number of common rules set in treaties and that no state shall unilaterally reject. This multipolarity, though undeniable, still faces resistance and rebuke on the pretext of the universality of certain values some powers would impose their model of society and governance, thereby fomenting a new form of division of the world that reminds us of the worst moment of the Cold War. Today, countries are labeled as enemies because they are simply deemed competitors or because they refuse to take side, irrespective of their context and history. Others are pressured to line up behind an ideology creating a world of us and them. Nowadays, important treaties are denounced unilaterally. Despite its clear provision, interference has been common and proliferating against what was enshrined in our charter. An authorization to interfere in the affairs of a sovereign state has been introduced into international law, but only for humanitarian reason. It is indeed deceptive and deceitful that humanitarian reasons were used as pretext to interfere in domestic affairs and even to provoke some regime change by undemocratic means. Government fabricated claims and accusation based on false information relayed by the mainstream media or rather moonlighting media to justify interference of all kinds, creating instability, tension, and most of the time, chaos and people suffering. As a result, the world is full of uncertainties. 
the international community encounters deleterious challenges in a form of geopolitical rivalry, armed conflict, to which are added growing terrorism, extremism, radicalism, and other non-conventional security threats. The armed race is revived by the reckless use of threat and the breaking of international commitments, all at the expense and the detriment of the world in its effort to reduce poverty, combat climate change, and promote better life quality and prosperity. Free and fair trade is threatened by new forms of protectionism, Climate change-related natural disasters are becoming more intense, more dramatic, and more frequent, with worsening humanitarian consequences. Mr. President, distinguished delegates, we are asked to reflect on how to galvanize multilateral efforts to meet these global challenges. I believe the answer requires that we address two fundamental issues. First, how do we ensure peace, security, and stability of the world? And second, how do we get multilateralism back on track and make it effective once again? The increasingly serious threat to the global security and to the future of our planet are a direct consequence of the weakening of multilateralism. It is imperative to reverse this trend. Development, when truly sustainable, should be a positive factor to tackle most of the problems the world is facing. Globalization of the world economy, driven by an effective multilateralism, has greatly facilitated trade, investment, flow of people, and technological advances for nearly a century. Yet, everything has its flip side. While globalization supports economic growth, it also widens disparities and raises the issue of equity and inclusiveness. Industrialization has created material wealth never seen before, but it has also strained the environment and caused it irre irreparable damage if goes uncontrolled. Protectionism and self-isolation would lead us nowhere. We firmly believe that openness would offer us new opportunities and could counter the zero-sum game mentality, thus promoting an inclusive and common development necessitates that we favor dialogue and partnership instead of confrontation and aggression. Other gra grave threats, such as new environmental pressures pose serious challenges to sustainable development and the implementation of our 2030 agenda. Far too long, we have taken our natural resources, such as fresh air and blue sky, clean water and healthy soil for granted. We have been unkind to them and now they are unkind to us. Global environmental issues cannot be tackled by the efforts of some countries alone. Countries large and small need to join hands in a concerted effort to engineer innovative financing to help affected countries finance their green growth and build resilience. This is how we can sustain the implementation of the Paris Agreement, which is the milestone in the history of climate governance. Cambodia, as one of the most vulnerable countries, will continue to take steps to tackle climate change 
and fully honor its obligation. A few days ago, the Climate Summit was convened here in New York. We do hope that the international solidarity will be more forthcoming. Mr. President, distinguished delegates, Allow me now to briefly share with you the main developments which have taken place in my country. We have significant grounds to be pleased, but we also have serious concerns. The commitment of Cambodia to a liberalized economy and to multilateralism has made it possible to see unprecedented growth in wealth and in the standard of living over the last two decades. With an average growth rate of 7% for more than 20 years, Cambodia is classified by the World Bank as the sixth most rapidly growing country in the world. Cambodia has achieved the majority of the Millennium Development Goals ahead of time. Our Human Development Index has considerably increased in recent decades, which places us in the category of average human development and makes us the eighth most highly performing country in the world over this period. Between 1990 and 2017, life expectancy at birth increased by almost 16 years moving from 53.6 years to 69.3 years. Cambodia has seen a net reduction in infant and maternal mortality and a net reduction in the number of deaths due to AIDS, malaria and tuberculosis. Access to primary education is now virtually universal and the rate of school enrollment in primary education is around 100% both for girls and boys. We translate our commitment summed up by the phrase leave not no one behind into policies and actions. The adoption of the National Strategic uh, Framework for Social Protection 2016-2025 marked a turning point which illustrates the great importance that my government attaches to social protection. Previously, my country benefited from United Nations peacekeeping operations. Today, Cambodia has become one of the most active contributors to these missions, with more than 6,300 blue helmets deployed in eight African countries and in the Middle East since 2006. This year, Cambodia has been placed 29th of 122 countries providing contingents and has been placed third amongst countries of ASEAN for the greatest number of peacekeepers. Our government is pursuing priority goals. Firstly, the maintenance of peace and political stability and the consolidation of a pluralistic democracy. And secondly, ensuring as a matter of priority the fundamental rights of our peoples, in particular the right to food, health, education, housing, work and mobility. During the last general election, 77% of voters expressed their support for these policies. I would also like to share with you some of our serious concerns. The Paris Peace Agreements of, on Cambodia of 1991 provided for the establishment of a democratic system on the Western model in a country that had never known this system. As everyone knows, democracy cannot be decreed. It has to be learnt progressively. In this area, we have taken giant steps forward. If you just look at our recent and, above all, tragic history, our constitution, our legislation, and our institutions 
are largely inspired from the Western model. Since 1993, we have renewed our National Assembly every five years, and in our last election, which was last year, we had a participation rate that Western countries, many Western countries could only dream of. We had a participation rate of 83%. Nevertheless, we are facing practices which bear little resemblance to democracy. If, under democracy, uh, we understand respect for the law, but also respect for institutions and for people. We are grappling with a small part of the opposition, which has gained popularity by taking, making the choice of demagoguery, racism and xenophobia. This opposition employs methods which are universally condemned, namely defamation, the publication of fake documents, the spreading of fake news, uh, incitement to racial hatred, violence, and sedition. A critical line was crossed when the president of this opposition confided to his militants that he was benefiting from financing and technical assistance from a foreign power in order to overthrow the government, following the modus operandi of the color revolutions that we have seen elsewhere. We then applied the legislation on the books, which, let me repeat, is in no way different from the laws applied in the West when a political party acts outside the law. It is for this that we are being criticized today. And it is this that justifies, in the eyes of some, the imposition of sanctions. We are facing interference from governments and institutions uh, which wish to dictate to us how we should draft and apply our laws, who finance directly or indirectly a political faction, who attempt to impose on our political life people who themselves have placed themselves on the margin, in the margins of society by repeatedly violating the law, who exert pressure on the guidelines for our foreign policy, and who do not hesitate to impose sanctions uh, in the name of values and principles which they invoke in some circumstances and which they choose to completely forget in others according to the dictates of expediency. Like other peoples, we the Cambodians simply want to live in freedom, to be ourselves, to make our own choices and to peacefully defend our essential national interests and our sovereignty in accordance with our values, our aspirations and our own specificities. The relevance of international law is to be found in equity and justice, but also in the way in which it is implemented. This is why we expect that all countries and all international institutions ensure that there is a uniform application of international law and refrain from a selective application of this law. Cambodia would like to see genuine cooperation with all countries subject to one condition and one condition alone, that is, respect for our sovereignty. We will not accept any interference under any circumstances, and we will not compromise our sovereignty in exchange for any form of cooperation or preference. Mr. President, distinguished delegates, I conclude by sharing with you this conviction. In a multipolar world, multilateralism can only succeed if it rejects all forms of interference from the principles of equality and sovereignty established in the Peace of Westphalia more than 360 years ago to the United Nations Charter. The world has at its disposal the principles necessary to guide our international relations. The sovereignty of all countries, rich or poor, great or small, strong or weak, must be respected. There can be no foreign interference in their domestic affairs. Their social system and the paths which they choose for their development remain sovereign choices. It is by respecting the right of peoples to self-determination, solemnly enshrined in our Charter, that we will breathe life into multilateralism and that we will find the path of stability, solidarity, 
and progress. I thank you. I thank His Excellency Brax Sohon, Deputy Prime Minister, Minister for Foreign Affairs and International Cooperation of Cambodia.